Good morning. Uh, thanks to Skift and thanks to Rafet for uh, inviting me here to speak to you today. Uh, most importantly, I'd like to thank him for putting me first on the agenda um, because I have a seven-week-old at home. And because I was first on the agenda, it gave me an excuse to actually stay at a hotel in the city last night. So I slept for six whole hours. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I, I went to sleep like I'd been hit on the head with a baseball bat. I actually woke up like I'd been hit on the head with a baseball bat as well, because when you haven't slept for two months, six hours suddenly kind of takes you to another world. But, you know, we're, we're all gathered here today because I think there are few businesses that have been as impacted uh, by the rise of technology, and particularly mobile, over the last few years as travel. You know, at Starwood, for a number of years, we've been talking about the fact that we're living in, a, in an age of great change with huge implications for our, for our business for, and guest expectations in particular. I think the, the key macro trends for this group will, will be no surprise. It's kind of digital and particularly mobile devices driving what we call connected living, you know, where consumers are increasingly looking for truly customized experiences at the same time as they're really building their own online brands. Now, I'm actually a, a, a history graduate, which gives me two things. One, it means I'm technically unemployable. Um, the second thing is that I always like to set things in the context of, 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 of the past and, and where we've come from. So to begin this morning, I want to take you back to a dim and distant past three years ago, 2011. And at that time, we sat down and said, Let, let's take a view on what the world of travel might look like in 2020. So that was eight or nine years in the future. And we put together a piece that was a hypothetical trip that I would take to Rio in the year 2020. Now, why am I showing you this today? It's been really informative for us. We put this vision in place and to see how much has changed in, in 36 months. You know, the trip started with something very straightforward. We were going to go to our SPG. That's our loyalty. We have an SPG app. I was going to go to my SPG app and try and instigate a voice-activated booking. Now, voice activation, so what? But we forget that actually something like Siri was only introduced in October 2011. And uh, we talked to this about a month before that launch. And Steve Jobs, unfortunately, was not in the habit of calling me in advance of major product launches. But this has now become every day. You know, we suggested that as I made my request, um, I'd also be able to see which of my friends were either in Rio over the time or had been there before and could make recommendations. And that information would be delivered in real time together with the reservation. Now, by 2012, we'd actually integrated SPG Social. So you could sign up to your social networks and do exactly that. As you were going to Rio, your friends could interact with you. And clearly, it becomes more and more engaging the more friends join in and the kind of the more uh, you sign up and travel. We looked at integrating instant translation capabilities to the SPG app. And again, instant translation now is something that's pretty every day. We also looked at location services so that there's no more of that scanning around the airport looking for your, your name. And we introduced SPG location awareness again back in 2012. You know, we talked about flexible check-in. So you weren't locked into the traditional you know, check-in at 3, check-out at noon. And to do that, we introduced a Your24 program where you can actually check in anytime you want, day or night. Eye scanning. You know, the idea of using eye scanning, fingerprint, any kind of biometric data is now more and more used. You can actually obviously get into your phone, your mobile device. You can access your bank account. You can even come into the United States through the Trusted Traveler program. Unfortunately, even after six and a half years here, I'm still not considered a trusted traveler. I don't qualify, but I hear it works very, very well. You know, we're, we're not at quite at the eye scanning stage yet, but a couple of months ago, we did introduce our version of SPG Keyless, where you can use your mobile device, download, and get your, your room entry. And we've been, we've been testing that and modeling it in the last couple of months. And it will be rolled out through all of our hotels, uh, all of our W element and loft hotels uh, by next year. So bypass the front desk. I think it's going to become the norm. You know, one other area I think is important it's not all about just about putting technology in the hands of guests. We were testing um, uh, energy and, and, and water management systems. We tested that in our Element brand, which is a little bit of a green uh, laboratory for us. And we've now actually introduced as a brand standard energy management systems across all nine of our brands as part of our overall sustainability efforts. 
content. You know, we were always in the hotel business trying to make sure we had, you know, the latest hardware. But really what we need to be doing now is aligning in-room entertainment with people's personal devices uh, and their content. So they're actually viewing their own world. So we started a couple of years ago, we tested a full Apple TV install at our Aloft Hotel in, in Cupertino, a logical place to do it. And now we've actually taken that a step further and built out a fully intelligent room that not only allows you to throw your content onto the screen, but also control the light, the heat, alarm calls, call room service, etc., And do that all through the SPG app on your personal device. You know, all of this came to pass, if there's any soccer fans in the, in the audience, since this was my dream of 2020, I actually had my team, Queen's Park Rangers, playing Barcelona in the uh, Champions League <laughs> and beating them 4-0. So a lot, of this came, a lot of this stuff came to pass, but since this was my fantasy, I, uh, I threw that one in. You know, in terms of technology, it was interesting. Uh, in mid-2011, The Economist actually uh, ran a cover story on what was then the science fiction world of 3D printing. Um, and how quickly that has become mainstream. There's actually a MakerBot store on, on my kind of high street out in the suburbs. Um, I had this idea that we could put a scan of my foot into my guest profile, and I could just save myself from uh, carrying all that bulky uh, running shoes, et cetera, because they could 3D, a print and put, 3D, 3D print a pair and put them directly in my room so I could save uh, lugging all that stuff around. Well, it's not available in our room just yet, but this actually is a, a fully working prototype of a 3D shoe uh, produced over at Nike. So even some of that complete science fiction stuff is, is, is kind of coming to pass. You know, I think finally, um, the thought that my smartphone would become a transmission badge that would actually kind of track my location and needs whilst I was on the trip in the hotel has really come to pass. Um, we've been working with, obviously, Apple and some of their beaconing technology to allow us to do just that. So that was a four-minute version of what was a much deeper and broader 40-minute take. I just took some, some outtakes from that. I could have shown you more things that we'd suggested as 2020 that have actually come to pass in the last 24 uh, or 36 months. So eight to nine years seemed like it was close enough to be real but far enough out to be kind of visionary, and suddenly two years later a lot of it is kind of normal in everyday life. But I think the reason I want to show a little bit of history is we've learned some stuff along the way. Because I think there is a danger today that you fall in love with technology. You fall in love with capabilities for the sake of technology. And actually, you lose sight of what we're really in business for, particularly in our space. And ultimately, you know, we need to be thinking about guest experience in its fullest sense. And what, what is it that technology can do to enhance the guest experience? So if you put guest experience at the center of what we do, there are a number of things that clearly connect with that and deliver. The first one we mustn't forget is you need to deliver the hospitality fundamentals. There are some pretty timeless things. Check me in, check me out, make sure I'm safe, make sure I'm secure, I have a, a good night's sleep. My room is clean, and increasingly people want seamless connectivity. If you don't have those, you don't have the right to do, frankly, some of the sexier stuff, really thinking about the product design, the programming, how technology interfaces, and of course, service. And increasingly, and we'll all be talking a lot about this, personalization. But again, personalization almost comes at the end. You have to have delivered the broader experience first. I'll just take a couple of minutes to talk about you know, each of the, the four in the middle there in turn. You know, product. I mean, I think design truly does help us kind of define our brands and, and give that individual experience in this very dynamic world. You know, we have to create physical spaces that really are both functional and inspiring, are really talking to timeless guest needs, you know, for comfort and human interaction, at the same time as recognizing there is a 24-7 need to stay connected and interact and integrated in the way that people work today. You know, we're really committed in this area to design. You know, with that in mind, Uh, about five years ago, we actually brought all of our design functions together, architects, interior designers, graphic designers, digital designers, into one brand and innovation studio down in Tribeca. And we felt we needed that to have kind of a sense of one hand, one brand across all of the design delivery. And in fact, we're actually moving in about three weeks. Uh, we're doubling the size of that space, and we're creating the, the Star Lab Brand Innovation Center uh, in, the, in the garment district. We're going we're to have about 
uh, 200 designers across all different functions working on thinking about the future of guest experience. But you know, it's not just about building a, a, a beautiful box. And there's a lot of beautiful boxes out there. It really is about bringing the space to life, activating it, creating energy. And we focus on this through what we call our brand passion points. And just to share an example of that with the St. Regis brand. One campaign we ran last year was for um, what we call the new St. Regis Grand Tour, which really aimed to appeal to that kind of global elite guest staying in our ultra-luxury hotel brand. So we partnered with a up-and-coming, not he's really up-and-come, Taiwanese uh, fashion designer. He's designed dress, Jason Wu, he's designed dresses for Michelle Obama, uh, amongst others, to help us tell the story of the new Grand Tour. You know, it used, to be, it used to be Florence, it used to be Venice. It's now Florence, you know, Kuala Lumpur, Shenzhen, Abu Dhabi, and beyond. So we named Jason a connoisseur. He designed a Grand Tourista bag for us, and then we interacted with his social network and our social network to actually really talk about the joy of travel and the luxury space. And I think in a lot of ways, when we talk about an age of great change, there's nothing maybe more illustrative of that than the idea of a century-old luxury heritage American brand working with a young Chinese fashion designer and interacting with guests in so with social media. Technology. I mean, clearly the role of technology you know, kind of can't be overstated to all of us and to us in particular. You saw some examples of that in our 2020 thinking. And we're going to continue to work in this area. It's still central to our thinking, you know, from piloting intelligent rooms, as I mentioned, expanding our range of app-delivered guest functionality, testing wearable tech, you know, all the way to our, our butler, which is our robot butler, um, which we've been testing in, in a couple of locations. A couple of things about it. It's important to say this is not about replacing people. This is for our kind of uh, select serve brands where these are going to be able to deliver services that otherwise wouldn't be available 24-7. And it's funny, we, we tested this in two places, and I should share this as an anecdote. We tested it in Brooklyn, and we tested it in Cupertino. And in Brooklyn, as uh, Butler was going about his business, people are like, wow, is that, a, is, is, is that a robot? That's cool. In Cupertino, they're like, it's a robot. <laughs> so, you know, know your guess, it, it changes. So technology... Clearly important. You know, Apple's new launch a couple of weeks ago, you know, um, Tim Cook, the CEO, obviously talked to, you know, the functionality that could be built into the Apple Watch as people start thinking about how they do it. One of the apps that uh, it was shown was our SPG uh, app, where you can actually just use your watch to access the room. And we were pleased that the New York Times reported, and I, I will read this appropriately, that the app that garnered the most oohs and ahs was a Starwood app that let you check into a hotel room just by waving your watch at the door. Killer app indeed. So this is stuff, you know, even in my 2020 vision three years ago, I hadn't thought about trying to get in to the room with your watch. So I think, you know, it's clear that getting our, our, our technology and getting our desk, guest data platforms, you know, in line and, and really is fundamental to our vision of delivering uh, personalization and delivering guest experience for the future. But something that we've definitely learned along the way is that technology is not going to win the hearts and minds long term of guests. You know, our guests, particularly the millennium travel, traveler, they expect technology to be embedded before, during, and after. They expect it. They're actually not going to thank you for it. You know, in the end, technology is really, really just a tool. You know, we remain in business, we say, to deliver a better way for people to experience the world when they're traveling. And ultimately, guests don't stay in an app. You know, an app can help the experience, but it's not going to make their experience. And in some ways, we think the more things change, the more they stay the same. And this is an image that really brought it home to me. I found it a couple of years ago, and it really made me rethink what it was we were doing in these spaces. This is actually taken at the Golden Hirsch Hotel in Salzburg in Austria. It's the oldest operating hotel in our system, and it opened in 1407. Okay, that's a few years before Christopher Columbus was sailing the ocean blue. I'm not sure Mr. and Mrs. Columbus had even thought about little Christopher at that time. So, and what this is, is actually a picture from the general manager's office on the first floor down to the front desk. And so, in 1407, when Herr Schmidt arrived, the general manager could look through that tunnel to the front desk, could see their face, and could hear them. And as they then walked up the steps, he could step out of his office and say, Guten Morgen, Herr Schmidt. That's the extent of my German, by the way. Hello, Herr Schmidt. Personalization. And if you think about it, a lot of what we're doing today all of, kind of the, the, the big data systems technology is really just the 21st century version of that tunnel from the general manager's office to the front desk. 
you know, if we build those systems effectively, we'll be able to see and hear our guests wherever they are in this increasingly connected world. And human beings don't change much. Herr Schmidt was pretty happy to be personally greeted by the general manager. And I think when you guys travel or go to a restaurant or go to a bar where they actually recognize you, you feel pretty good about it. So ultimately, the real magic isn't technology, we think. It's something much more timeless than that. It's actually people. And I think it was important I said that our, our, our bottler was not designed to replace people because you know, our perspective is that design, programming, technology can, can really help to inspire. But in this business, human interaction is always what's going to create those kind of long-term emotional connections and great memory. And we are in an emotional business. People love to travel. You know, ultimately, we also recognize that it's our associates who are on the front line dealing with guests. They are smarter than any smartphone. So a lot of the work that we're doing is about actually using technology to put information in their hands so that they know their guests. They can look through that tunnel of the 21st century and serve them and deliver for them a great experience. So our sense is to be a meaningful brand you know, in the world today in our business, you actually have to be able to deliver not just the new and the shiny, but the timeless. You know, you have to be able to know and recognize and respond to your guests just as they've been doing at the Golden Hirsch in Salzburg for over six centuries. And at the same time, really kind of get people connected and interacted. Technology and big data in a lot of ways are just the latest tools in the arsenal, the latest weapons in the arsenal for us to deliver a great guest experience. So that was our perspective on where we are, where we've come from. I'm looking forward to, to listening today to people from you know, all across the business and, and learning a lot that hopefully we can then take away and apply to our model. I hope it was interesting. Thank you.